Good afternoon from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I'm Stephen Clark, editor of SpaceFlightNow.com, and welcome to our coverage of the second launch attempt for ULA's Atlas V rocket to uh, lift off on the United States Space Force's USS F-12 mission from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. You're looking at a live view of the Atlas V out at Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral, where cryogenic propellant loading is underway at this hour. The launch window today opens at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, or 2200 UTC. There is a two-hour window available. If you joined us yesterday, you'll know that this launch attempt uh, was scrubbed for this mission yesterday evening due to storms in the Cape Canaveral area. The weather forecast uh, for this evening is also iffy, with a 40% chance of good weather for a launch at the opening of the window at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. The odds of a good weather uh, decrease somewhat through the window. The window extends until 8 p.m. Eastern Time tonight, just as it did yesterday. A status check of the propellant loading at this hour. On the left-hand side of your screen, you can see that the uh, Centaur upper stage has its liquid oxygen tank at the 75% full level at this time. This tank will hold 4,150 gallons of oxidizer chilled to about 300 degrees below zero. The Atlas first stage, uh, the kerosene fuel tank on that stage is full of its 25,000 gallons of propellant. That was loaded into the rocket on Wednesday, uh, soon after the rocket rolled out to the launch pad. And then later in the countdown, we expect to see the liquid hydrogen tank on the center upper stage loaded with about 12,000 gallons of uh, cryogenic fuel. And we've also confirmed that the cryogenic loading has happened liquid oxygen loading has happened or has, has begun on the first stage, the Atlas first stage, uh, but uh, it has not quite reached uh, a percentage yet that we can show on this graphic. On the upper right of your screen, I'll draw your attention to the countdown clock. The countdown is currently at T minus one hour, 26 minutes and 34 seconds and counting. However, the countdown clock is heading for a pre-planned built-in hold at T minus four minutes and when we reach that hold, that countdown clock will be stopped at four minutes for 30 minutes. And just for your awareness, we've added a time to launch clock underneath this T minus clock, and that's the actual time until the opening of the launch window at 6 p.m. Eastern time or 2200 UTC, which is the current target launch time for this countdown. Today's launch will mark the 94th flight of an Atlas V rocket and the fourth Atlas V launch of the year. And this mission is designated USS F-12, carrying two United States Space Force satellites into orbit. The Atlas V and its Centaur upper stage will target a near-geosynchronous orbit more than 22,000 miles or about 36,000 kilometers over the equator. This is a circular orbit, so three burns by the Centaur upper stage will be required to insert these two satellites into this orbit tonight. And that takes uh, quite a long time, so from liftoff until the final deployment of the payload is about six hours and five minutes. So there won't be any uh, quick confirmation of a successful mission tonight if the launch happens at uh, 6 p.m. Eastern that uh, final deployment activity or event would occur around 12.05 a.m. Eastern Time or 4.05 UTC tonight. These two payloads include the Space Force's wide field of view test bed. This is an experimental satellite uh, hosting an infrared uh, sensor that will test technology for future or next generation infrared detectors designed to uh, sense the heat plume of missile launches. This is part of the military's early warning system uh, designed to give military forces uh, advance notice of incoming missile attacks. And the sensor on this particular spacecraft is a pathfinder or tech demo for the next generation of missile warning uh, satellites that are being developed by the Space Force. The other payload on this mission is called the USSF-12 Ring spacecraft. 
And this is a propulsive uh, ring-shaped spacecraft that hosts a number of classified experiments for the de Department of Defense. Uh, we don't know much about what these experiments are doing other than uh, some of them include tech demos and prototype experiments for future technology and future capabilities uh, to be fielded by the Space Force. We'll be continuing to bring you uh, updates throughout the remainder of the countdown. Right now, we're not aware of any technical issues in the countdown this time. The main concern continues to be the weather with a 40% chance of favorable conditions now uh, for launch at the open of tonight's two-hour window at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, or 2200 UTC.
The countdown clock is now passing T minus one hour and 15 minutes or an hour and 45 minutes until the opening of the window. Again, the clocks you're seeing on the upper right, the one in red is the uh, T minus clock. That clock is heading to a built in hold at T minus four minutes. That hold is scheduled to last 30 minutes in duration. So you're seeing the time to launch on the uh, clock below that is the time in real time until the opening of the window at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. In the last few minutes, we've heard confirmation that the liquid oxygen tank on the Centaur upper stage has been loaded with its uh, 4,150 gallons of cryogenic oxidizer, and the liquid oxygen tank on the Atlas first stage has passed the 20% level. Liquid hydrogen loading onto the Centaur will begin soon. You're seeing some of the vapors um, visible out at the launch pad uh, streaming away from the vehicle as these cryogenics are loaded and as uh, some of these uh, fluids boil off in the warm Florida atmosphere. This particular view comes from our camera position about four miles from pad 41. You're looking roughly east from our position out toward the complex where the Atlas V is positioned behind the uh, umbilical tower in this particular angle. You can see part of that uh, large payload shroud uh, sticking above the uh, umbilical tower on the mobile launch platform. And near the base of the vehicle, you can see one of the four strap-on solid rocket boosters uh, visible with its uh, canted nose uh, on the side of the first stage booster. To the left of the vehicle in this view is the crew access tower. This is the structure that uh, was built up a few years ago to uh, support astronaut missions on the Atlas V rocket. The Atlas V is on contract for uh, seven crew missions on Bo using uh, Boeing's Starliner spacecraft. The Atlas V will be launching the Starliner on missions to the International Space Station. Uh, the Atlas V has launched uh, two Starliner test flights so far without astronauts, including one just uh, about a month ago, last uh, in May, at the end of May. And that uh, cleared the way for uh, future Starliner missions to carry astronauts. The first of these uh, crew missions on the Starliner will be a test flight that is expected to launch uh, as soon as the end of this year, perhaps early in 2023, uh, per the current schedule from Boeing, who says uh, it's on track to have the spacecraft ready for the crew mission by the end of the year. But to where the launch date actually falls, it depends on a number of other factors. That crew access tower is the, uh, at the top of that crew access tower is a, an arm that stretches out and connects up to the Starliner spacecraft. And that's where astronauts would board the Starliner on top of the Atlas V for those future crew missions. Today's mission has uh, no crew on board, no astronauts on this mission. This is a satellite delivery mission for the US Space Force. Uh, two experimental payloads on board this evening's flight. So I've pointed out uh, the vehicle, the Atlas V. I've pointed out the crew access tower. The other major structures out there are these four lightning towers, two on each side of the rocket, and these are lightning masts that are connected with a catenary wiring system to uh, help uh, guide electrical charges away from the vehicle in the event of a lightning strike while the rocket is out on the pad. One more thing of note uh, on the lower uh, left of the vehicle, just to the left of the leftmost lightning tower is the top half of a spherical structure. This is the liquid oxygen tank at pad 41 that holds the uh, cryogenic oxidizer that is now being pumped into the rocket uh, in the countdown today. So now an hour and 41 minutes until the opening of the window. We just heard confirmation that the, the Atlas first stage is now 40% full of liquid oxygen. So cryogenic tanking well underway this afternoon. Uh, no technical issues that we've heard at this point in the countdown. The only concern right now is the weather conditions here on Florida's Space Coast.
Here's a look at the current uh, radar picture along Florida's Space Coast. You can see some uh, thunderstorms are building off to the west. Now a satellite view from one of the GOES weather satellites up in geosynchronous orbit. A billowing clouds of uh, storms building over central Florida. Uh, right now there's no thunderstorm activity in the immediate vicinity of Cape Canaveral. However, uh, there are clouds overhead that uh, may be in violation of uh, weather rules throughout the countdown. We haven't heard uh, recently whether the weather rules are currently being violated, but the weather outlook at last check called for a 40% chance of go weather at the time of uh, the opening of the window at 6 p.m. Eastern time, and those odds of good weather declined throughout the uh, two-hour window with the worst conditions expected at uh, the closure of the window at 8 p.m. Eastern time. So this remains the main watch item during the countdown. At last check with a cryogenic uh, tanking, the Atlas first stage was 80% full of its 48,800 48, gallons of uh, oxidizer. And the Centaur upper stage liquid hydrogen tank is now 30% full with its roughly 12,000 gallons of fuel. And we've just received moments ago an update from United Launch Alliance that the odds of acceptable weather at the open of tonight's launch window at 6 p.m. Eastern Time have increased to 50% from 40%. And the main concern at the opening of the window will be anvil clouds over the uh, launch site and then the flight path of the Atlas V rocket uh, from nearby thunderstorms. Uh, anvil clouds uh, can pose a threat of lightning uh, as the rocket flies through them. So that's the main weather concern, uh, but the weather condition is trending. The weather conditions are, are trending in the right direction, according to the launch weather officer.
cryogenic tanking is uh, nearing completion at this time, uh, not quite done yet. The Centaur liquid hydrogen tank is at 70% full, and the Atlas first stage liquid oxygen tank is at 90% full at last check. The Centaur liquid oxygen tank has been fully loaded uh, earlier in the countdown this afternoon, and the Atlas kerosene or RP-1 fuel tank was loaded on Wednesday. So these are the uh, figures uh, of the propellants, liquid propellants that are loaded into the Atlas V for launch. Uh, 25,000 gallons for the Atlas first stage, uh, nearly 49,000 gallons of liquid oxygen on the first stage, and then about uh, 16,000 gallons of cryogenics on the Centaur upper stage, uh, 12,300 gallons of hydrogen, and 4,150 gallons of oxygen. Uh, the liquid oxygen is chilled to about minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit, and the liquid hydrogen going into the Centaur upper stage is chilled to uh, below f minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. The kerosene, or RP-1, on the Atlas first stage is stored near room temperature, so it can remain on board the vehicle for an extended period of time, whereas the cryogenics uh, boil off in the atmosphere, as you can see in the view of the pad, the vapor streaming away from the vehicle. Uh, that's the boil off from the cryogenics as they're loaded into uh, the rocket during the countdown. So those cryogenics are loaded late in the countdown, just uh, in a couple of hours before uh, liftoff time. In addition to the liquid propellants, uh, the four strap-on solid rocket boosters are uh, packed with solid fuel. The, those solid propellants were loaded into the boosters during their manufacturing process out at Northrop Grumman. And uh, so those uh, boosters already have their fuel on board. So in the next uh, half hour or so, once the cryogenic tanking is completed and topping off is completed on all the tanks, uh, the rocket will be full of propellant and weigh about 1.2 million pounds in preparation for liftoff uh, this afternoon. Again, the weather forecast has improved somewhat with a 50% chance now of good weather for the opening of the window at 6 p.m. Eastern Time or 2200 UTC to begin this uh, satellite deployment flight for the United States Space Force. The clock is now approaching T minus 45 minutes. That's an hour and 15 minutes away from liftoff time. Again, there's a 30 minute disparity in these clocks uh, due to a pre-planned built-in hold that is uh, scheduled for T minus four minutes. So you'll see the clock in red on the upper right go down to T minus four minutes and hold. Uh, all the while that time to launch clock will continue moving until uh, targeting a liftoff at 6 p.m. Eastern time from here at Cape Canaveral, Florida. This uh, built-in hold is uh, a standard part of all Atlas V countdowns. It has been since the uh, genesis of the program uh, 20 years ago. And uh, the T-minus four-minute hold gives time for the team to catch up on any uh, issues they may be working in the countdown and also allows time for the uh, customary pre-launch readiness poll that's uh, performed by the launch conductor. That poll is uh, typically conducted by the launch conductor about seven minutes before liftoff time during that T-minus four-minute hold.
T minus 32 minutes and 26 seconds. On the upper right of your screen, you can see two different clocks. Just want to clarify what the clocks are uh, showing. The clock in red on the top of the graphic is the so-called T minus clock. That's the clock that we're seeing inside the launch control center uh, that's coming from the ULA launch team. That clock will be uh, stopped when it reaches four minutes. And there's a built-in hold at T minus four minutes that will last for 30 minutes. And during that 30 minute hold, ULA's launch team will catch up on any uh, outstanding or unresolved issues in the countdown. And the team will also go through their customary pre-launch readiness poll during that T minus four minute hold. And then at that point, the clock will resume at T minus four minutes and counting for that final four minute terminal countdown sequence leading up to liftoff. The clock below that that says a time to launch is the time from now until the opening of the window at 6 p.m. Eastern time or 2200 UTC. So liftoff, if it remains as scheduled, is now one hour and one minute away approximately while the countdown clock from launch control is at T minus 31 minutes. At this point in the countdown, ULA's launch team has uh, completed most of the cryogenic loading onto the vehicle. Uh, the propellant tanks are still uh, undergoing topping right now, but uh, once that final topping is completed, the vehicle will reach its uh, final launch uh, weight of nearly 1.2 million pounds. And the RD-180 main engine on the Atlas V rocket, along with the four strap-on boosters, will be generating 2.3 million pounds of thrust at liftoff. So that's almost a two-to-one ratio uh, thrust to weight when the Atlas V uh, takes off this evening. So now about one hour until the opening of the window, the weather conditions continue to look uh, more optimistic and more favorable than before. However, uh, right now, the weather one weather rule is currently red, the anvil cloud rule. This is associated with the uh, anvil clouds uh, that are streaming off the top of nearby thunderstorms. Uh, these anvil clouds can hold electrical charge and could pose a threat if the Atlas V were to uh, fly through them and trigger a lightning strike. But uh, right now, we're uh, hearing from ULA that all the other weather rules are green at this time. So certainly, uh, the weather picture is uh, not as bleak as yesterday's uh, weather situation with uh, nu numerous thunderstorms right on the Space Coast. All the thunderstorms right now are inland, uh, but the, the anvil clouds off of these storms uh, are still an issue, and right now it's causing the anvil cloud rule to be red.
countdown clock here at Cape Canaveral is now at T-minus 22 minutes or 52 minutes until the opening of the window. Again, the clock is heading to a, a built-in hold at T-minus 4 minutes. And you'll see that uh, clock in red stop at that point. With the propellant loading uh, complete, the launch team is now uh, amidst a series of uh, valve cycle tests to make sure the propulsion system and the flow lines uh, leading to the engines are all ready to go for tonight's mission. Also in the next few minutes, we expect to hear confirmation of the fuel fill sequence uh, on the RD-180 main engine. That's the main engine on the bottom of the first stage. And ULA's launch conductor earlier uh, gave a go for uh, the team to begin final flight control preps. This involves a steering check of the thrust vector control system on the engines on the Atlas V to ensure that the steering system is ready for flight. So those are the major tasks underway at this point in the countdown. Now 51 minutes from the opening of tonight's launch window at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time or 2200 UTC. T minus 20 minutes and 15 seconds. Here you can see a, uh, a view of the various components of the Atlas V rocket flying tonight. And on the right-hand screen, of course, we're still showing a live view of the Atlas V out on pad 41. This particular Atlas V is flying in what's called the 541 or 541 configuration. The number five in that uh, designator represents the fact that this mission is flying with a five meter diameter payload fairing illustrated here in this uh, view provided by United Launch Alliance. The Atlas V can also fly with a uh, more narrow, uh, smaller fairing, a four meter fairing. But tonight's mission, the requirements of tonight's mission require this five meter fairing. The number four in 541 uh, represents the four strap-on solid rocket boosters uh, pictured here on the left side of this graphic. Uh, these boosters are provided by Northrop Grumman and they're called Jim 63s, graphite epoxy motor 63s. The 63 uh, represents the uh, diameter, 63 inches, of each of these motors. And these boosters will provide about 1.5 million pounds of thrust combined at liftoff out of the total 2.3 million pounds of, of thrust at liftoff. That's a little more than 60% uh, of the thrust at liftoff provided by these boosters. And the one in 541 represents the uh, single RL-10 engine on this uh, mission. The Centaur upper stage is powered by a single engine. Some variants of the Atlas V fly with two RL-10 engines. Tonight's mission has one. So those are the major uh, designators for the 541 configuration. Uh, this is the ninth flight of the Atlas V in this particular uh, version, the 541. And it's the 94th flight overall of an Atlas V rocket. Also in this graphic, you can see the uh, two payloads, the WFOV, or Wide Field of View spacecraft and the USS F-12 ring spacecraft stacked together inside the payload fairing. Uh, the WFOV test bed is in the upper position uh, to test out uh, next generation infrared sensors for missile detection and missile tracking purposes for the US Space Force. And the USS F-12 ring spacecraft is uh, hosting a number of classified experiments. And then at the uh, far left side, the main engine on the first stage, the RD-180, is actually making its 100th flight. This is the 100th flight of an RD-180 engine uh, on this particular mission, following uh, previous flights on the Atlas V, as well as six RD-180 missions that uh, powered the Atlas III rocket family, which is a uh, predecessor of the Atlas V, uh, beginning back in the year 2000. The RD-180 is uh, produced by a company called MPO Energomash outside of Moscow. And right now, ULA has uh, 23 RD-180s, uh, flight ready RD-180s in its uh, inventory. So there are 23 more Atlas Vs 
remaining to fly uh, with the RD-180 engine, including tonight's mission. And ULA is uh, retiring the Atlas V as well as its Delta rocket family uh, in favor of the next generation Vulcan Centaur vehicle, uh, which could fly around the end of the year is the current goal for ULA to get that first Vulcan test flight off the ground from Cape Canaveral. And the Vulcan Centaur will be powered by uh, all U.S. engines. The uh, booster engines on the uh, Vulcan Centaur will be supplied by Blue Origin. And the Vulcan Centaur will continue using the Aerojet Rocketdyne RL-10 engine on its upper stage. So these are the major components that I've uh, uh, walked you through of the Atlas V rocket. You see that vehicle out on pad 41. Now 46 minutes and 20 seconds from the opening of the window. Uh, to begin this 94th flight of an Atlas V rocket and the ninth Atlas V uh, to fly in this particular 541 configuration with four strap-on boosters. And this is the fourth Atlas V flight of the year. And in fact, it, it'll be the second this year to uh, fly in this particular 541 configuration. We've just heard a go from the uh, launch conductor at the Atlas Space Flight Operations Center here at Cape Canaveral to begin the fuel fill sequence on their RD-180 engine. This is a part of the final uh, steps to configure and condition the, RL, uh, the RD-180 engine for in ignition. And this is a step that uh, the team usually doesn't like to proceed into unless there's a realis realistic chance of launching. In fact, uh, during yesterday's countdown with the bleak weather uh, situation, the team did not give a go to begin the fuel fill sequence on the uh, main engine. And the engineers in the Atlas Space Flight Operations Center also confirmed that final flight control preps are complete. Uh, this uh, marks the conclusion of this uh, steering check in of the uh, Atlas V engines that I mentioned earlier to test out the thrust vector controls make sure all the hydraulic systems are, are ready to go for tonight's launch.
the countdown clock now is approaching T-minus 9 minutes and 30 seconds. The clock will be held at T-minus 4 minutes. This is a part of the go plan going into this countdown. Uh, T-minus 4-minute hold is part of every Atlas 5 countdown. And that hold will last for 30 minutes, allowing time for the team to uh, catch up with any issues that may uh, they may be working and also to give the weather another evaluation before proceeding into the terminal countdown. And uh, at L minus seven minutes, seven minutes before the uh, scheduled launch time is when the launch conductor will conduct his poll of the engineering uh, console uh, operators inside this Atlas Space Flight Operations Center at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station for their final go or no go for liftoff.
the countdown clock is approaching this hold at T minus four minutes. And the countdown clock has stopped at T minus four minutes. This is a planned 30 minute hold. So you can see that clock has stopped at four minutes. However, the time to launch clock continues ticking now inside of 34 minutes until the opening of the window. On the left hand side of your screen, you can see the propellant loading status. All four propellant tanks are confirmed at flight level. So about 90,000 gallons of liquid propellants have been loaded into the Atlas V. Uh, most of that loaded into the rocket during the countdown today. The RP-1 or kerosene fuel tank on the first stage was loaded earlier in the week. So the entire vehicle weighs about 1.2 million pounds right now in its launch ready state with the 90,000 gallons of liquid propellants as well as the pre-packed solid fuel inside of those four strap-on solid rocket boosters. So in the next uh, few minutes the countdown will be rather quiet as teams uh, keep watch of their systems to make sure all the uh, limits and parameters are within bounds. There will also be a weather briefing coming up during this hold. And then at L minus seven minutes, when that time to launch clock reaches about the seven minute point is when the launch conductor will pull his team for a go or no go to proceed into the terminal countdown.
The Atlas 5 countdown remains in this built-in hold at T-minus four minutes. In the latest weather briefing, the launch weather of officer briefed the uh, ULA team that the weather conditions are trending in the right direction, according to ULA. But there's a few more minutes needed until the final red weather rule, the no-go weather rule, can be cleared. And this rule, we believe, is associated with the anvil clouds uh, streaming over the launch site from the thunderstorms that have formed uh, to the north and west of the pad. Right now, the, there's no thunderstorm activity in the immediate vicinity uh, within about 20 to 30 miles of the uh, launch pad. But these clouds from the thunderstorms a little farther away uh, do hold some electrical charge. And the weather rule is that uh, none of these uh, anvil clouds can be overhead at launch time. We're going to play a video now of the uh, planned flight profile for tonight's mission. Here's what we can expect to see when the Atlas V begins its uh, flight for the USS F-12 mission for the Space Force. The RD-180 engine at the bottom of the first stage will ignite. A few seconds later, four strap-on solid rocket boosters will uh, come to life to produce about 2.3 million pounds of thrust to power the 196-foot-tall or 60-meter-tall Atlas V off the pad. It'll pass the speed of sound in about 58 seconds and then continue heading downrange to the east. The uh, strap-on boosters from Northrop Grumman, Grumman will burn for about a minute 40 seconds and then jettison a few moments later to fall into the Atlantic Ocean. This uh, map here from ULA, this is a video from the United Launch Alliance, shows the uh, expected trajectory generally toward the east from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station heading out over the Atlantic Ocean. This is necessary to reach the planned uh, equatorial uh, orbit at geosynchronous altitude. Uh, more than 22,000 miles over the equator. Uh, so this mission is heading east to enable that orbital insertion. Here you see a view of the 5.4-meter uh, diameter payload fairing. Inside that fairing are the two spacecraft for the Space Force uh, launching on tonight's mission. That fairing will be uh, jettisoned at about 3 minutes and 25 seconds after liftoff. Once the rocket reaches space, uh, flies, gets above the uh, dense lower layers of the atmosphere, at T plus 4 minutes and 24 seconds, the main engine, the RD-180, will cut off. And then a few seconds later, some retro rockets will fire to push that first stage away from the Centaur upper stage. And then the Centaur's RL-10 engine will go through a pre-start procedure and then ignite to produce more than 20,000 pounds of thrust, burning a liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen for a, a first burn to enter a uh, parking orbit. Then a second burn is planned about 23 minutes into the mission to uh, raise the apogee or high point of the orbit up to an altitude of more than 20,000 miles. And here you can see this graphic showing the trajectory of the rocket heading out over the Atlantic Ocean, then flying over Africa as it begins the uh, maneuvers to head up to geosynchronous orbit. Nearly six hours after liftoff, the RL-10 will reignite for a uh, third and final burn. This uh, burn will actually reshape this oval-shaped or elongated orbit into a circular orbit. This is all occurring nearly six hours after launch, uh, more than 22,000 miles above Earth. Once that burn is complete, the Centaur will uh, reorient itself for deployment of the first spacecraft riding in the upper position on the dual payload stack. This is the wide field of view test bed, a Space Force satellite testing a next generation uh, infrared sensor uh, for missile warning and missile tracking. This illustration shows the uh, circular geosynchronous orbit uh, high above the equator. And then the Centaur will uh, reorient itself into a different uh, attitude or orientation. It will jettison this adapter structure that covers the uh, second payload, the USS F-12 ring spacecraft. The USS F-12 ring spacecraft will then separate from the Centaur upper stage at T plus six hours and five minutes. So this is a, a long mission, a direct insertion to geosynchronous orbit. Both these spacecraft heading up on missions, on technology demonstration missions for the U.S. Space Force. And now we're back with a full frame view of Space Launch Complex 41, where the Atlas V is fully fueled at this time. 23 minutes left until the opening of tonight's window. Uh, it remains to be seen whether this uh, final no go weather rule associated with ample clouds will go green in time for launch at the opening of the window. But uh, there is a two-hour window to work with tonight, extending from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time, or 2200 uh, to midnight UTC.
As this countdown continues in this pre-planned hole, let's take a look at the payloads for tonight's mission. This is the wide field of view testbed spacecraft seen undergoing launch preparations uh, for tonight's mission. This particular spacecraft was built by Millennium Space Systems. It's a company based in El Segundo, California. It's a subsidiary of Boeing. And this spacecraft uh, weighs up to about uh, 6,000 pounds, roughly three metric tons, and hosts an instrument, a payload, uh, that will test a wide field of view infrared sensor. This sensor is a prototype for a ne next generation uh, instrument designed to uh, detect, track, and characterize missile threats. Uh, this is part of the Space Force's early warning network that consists of uh, satellites in orbit to uh, detect the heat plumes, the infrared heat signature, from the exhaust of rocket launches and missile launches. And this is the uh, system that the Space Force uses to detect any ballistic missile flight and also uh, the growing threat of hypersonic missiles. Uh, the Space Force says a sensor like this, which has an, has an ability to focus on a regional threat versus a, uh, a global, more strategic threat, uh, is well characterized for, or well designed for tracking hypersonic missiles, which uh, have a, a less intense heat plume than a traditional uh, ballistic missile that might be carrying a nuclear weapon uh, from an enemy country. So this is the test bed satellite, the primary payload in the upper position inside the Atlas V rocket's payload fairing. Here's a view of what this spacecraft will look like in orbit, uh, more than 22,000 miles over the equator with its uh, solar rays and antennas deployed. On the left side of the uh, spacecraft in this particular view is an illustration of this wide field of view, of view testbed infrared instrument. This instrument was built by L3 Harris and uh, the experiments for the wide field of view test bed are expected to last about three to five years. And we just heard from ULA's launch team that there is another issue uh, being worked in addition to the uh, Anvil Cloud rule. The upper level winds over Cape Canaveral uh, along the flight path are currently uh, not acceptable for flight. So this is another issue that will be uh, discussed by the ULA team. And ULA's launch conductor says that the uh, countdown preparations at this point will actually be uh, put into a holding pattern at the L minus 16 minute point. So the uh, payloads on top of the Atlas V will not be uh, switched to internal power and put into their final flight ready configuration just yet. And we're not expecting now that the launch will be happening at 6 p.m. and it's likely to be delayed or will be delayed into the window tonight uh, due to this upper level wind issue. At last report, the uh, anvil cloud rule is also red, but there was some optimism that that uh, anvil cloud weather rule uh, could clear, but we haven't heard yet if it has cleared. So right now we're aware of two issues with uh, anvil clouds that ho may hold uh, electro electrical charge that could be a lightning threat for the launch. And also the second issue is now with upper level winds.
Tonight's launch window now opens in uh, 15 minutes. However, we've heard confirmation from the United Launch Alliance that the liftoff won't be happening at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. There is currently no uh, target launch time available. The, the team is waiting to resolve uh, this uh, issue. Hopefully this issue clears with upper level winds. The clock you're seeing uh, now continues holding at T minus four minutes. And the clock you see moving below that, that says end of window, is now the time left until the end of tonight's launch window at 8 p.m. Eastern Time or midnight UTC.
the countdown clock is now at T minus four minutes and holding. You're seeing views now from Complex 41 of the Atlas V rocket, fully loaded with its uh, propellants, awaiting an opportunity to lift off this evening. The uh, launch window opens in eight minutes, or about eight minutes, at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, and runs until 8 p.m. Eastern Time. But the uh, countdown uh, is expected to delay the launch sometime into this window as ULA's launch team awaits the uh, res resolution of two issues, one involving the anvil clouds over the pad, as you can see in this view, as an overcast evening. Uh, these uh, high-altitude clouds uh, have been blowing off the tops of nearby thunderstorms, and there's a concern with the anvil clouds about them holding an electrical charge that could actually trigger uh, lightning when the rocket uh, rises through the, that cloud deck. This view comes from uh, Playa Linda Beach. This is also a ULA view uh, provided to us from the launch provider, showing crowds gathered at uh, Playa Linda Beach a few miles north of the launch site. A few minutes ago, I went over uh, one of the two spacecraft that's uh, on board this mission, the Wide Field of View test bed, which is going to a geosynchronous orbit to uh, test out a next generation infrared sensor for future missile tracking and missile detection uh, satellites. The other spacecraft on this mission is called the USS F-12 Ring spacecraft. It's uh, based on a Northrop Grumman a spacecraft bus called an ESPA-STAR bus. Uh, this uh, artist's illustration shows a generic uh, ESPA-STAR spacecraft platform. This uh, artist's illustration comes from Northrop Grumman. Uh, we don't have an illustration of the uh, exact uh, configuration of this particular spacecraft because some of the experiments uh, that are hosted on board are classified. But this is generally what the spacecraft looks like with this ring-shaped spacecraft bus uh, that has a deployable solar panel. It also has its own propulsion system. And then there are various nodes or connecting ports around the circumference of this ring where uh, a customer can plug in payloads, uh, instruments, experiments, and also uh, connect uh, satellites, small satellites, that can actually be deployed from this ring spacecraft uh, structure. Uh, so this uh, mission, the USSF-12 ring spacecraft on tonight's mission, is uh, hosting a number of classified experiments and payloads, uh, but the exact number and the details of what they're going to be doing uh, has not been released by the Space Force due to their classified nature. This uh, spacecraft will be riding in the lower position uh, inside the payload fairing of the Atlas V, and then above uh, this spacecraft during launch is a structure uh, that uh, connects the USS F-12 ring spacecraft with the upper spacecraft in this stack called the Wide, wide Field of View Testbed uh, spacecraft that I mentioned a few minutes ago. So these are the two spacecraft going to space on the Atlas V rocket for the U.S. Space Force uh, on a technology demonstration missions with a number of experiments to test out uh, different new capabilities for the military. We're back live at the uh, Cape Canaveral Space Force Station showing the Atlas V on Pad 41 awaiting an opportunity to launch tonight on this USS F-12 mission. The Space Force says this entire mission that includes the two payloads on board as well as the launch service uh, costs about $1.1 billion, so about a $1.1 billion price tag on this mission, which is designated USS F-12. As the Atlas V countdown remains in this hold, in its extended hold, to wait for weather conditions to improve. On the left side of your screen now, you're looking at a live view of the space launch system. 
This is NASA's uh, new super heavy lift moon rocket out on Launch Complex 39B this evening, located a few miles north of Pad 41 where the Atlas V is awaiting liftoff. The Artemis 1 uh, moon rocket is scheduled to be returned to the vehicle assembly building from the launch pad overnight tonight. NASA plans to uh, begin this rollback at around 11 p.m. Eastern Time or around 0300 UTC. And this rollback is expected to take about 8 to 12 hours to return this uh, huge vehicle back to the hangar, the vehicle assembly building here at Kennedy. And then once inside the vehicle assembly building, uh, the rocket will, will be uh, run through a final series of checks and tests. There will also be a repair to a hydrogen leak in a connector, a quick disconnect fitting near the bottom of the core stage that was uh, detected during a fueling test last month. And teams inside the VAB will also stow final experiments and payloads into the Orion crew module at the top of the space launch system. All of these preparations are to uh, ready the vehicle for a return to Pad 39B as soon as uh, August for a launch opportunity sometime before the end of August, potentially, if everything goes well, to begin the Artemis 1 mission to the moon. The Artemis 1 mission is an unpiloted test flight that will uh, demonstrate the space launch system and the Orion spacecraft uh, through various phases of flight, and the Orion spacecraft will return to a splashdown in the Pacific Ocean and the mission is uh, a precursor to future crew flights to the moon. And this first space launch system, moon rocket, is again scheduled to uh, move off of Pad 39B later tonight for an overnight rollback to the vehicle assembly building. For those of you tuning in, we're approaching the 6 p.m. hour here at Cape Canaveral. This was the original launch time and the opening of tonight's launch window. And the launch uh, won't be happening at 6 p.m., but there's still a good chance that the uh, launch could be happening later on during the window, which extends until 8 p.m. Eastern time. The weather team at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station at last check was optimistic that the Anvil Cloud weather rule, which is one of the two issues preventing uh, launch this evening right now, could be cleared and go green in the next 15 minutes or so. The other issue that's being tracked is uh, involving upper level winds, the winds in the upper atmosphere that the Atlas V would need to uh, navigate through on the way to space.
A few minutes ago, we showed you a live view of Launch Complex 39B, where the Artemis 1 moon rocket is awaiting a rollback later tonight to the Vehicle Assembly Building. Now we're showing a live view of the SpaceX Starship Launch Complex, which is taking shape at Pad 39A, a couple of miles to the south. This uh, tower that you're seeing next to this crane is being erected to support future launches of SpaceX's Super Heavy and Starship vehicle. This uh, next generation rocket program is a fully reusable uh, vehicle, and this will be the second orbital launch site for the Starship after the construction of the Boca Chica facility or Starbase facility in South Texas, where SpaceX uh, hopes to launch the first Starship orbital flight test later this year. Future operational missions will be launched uh, from this site, perhaps among other sites, uh, for the Starship program. Three of uh, as many as nine segments for this tower have been put into place at Pad 39A. The tower will eventually stand more than 400 feet tall and will, uh, is expected to be the second tallest structure at the Cape Canaveral Spaceport or the Kennedy Space Center, uh, second only to the Vehicle Assembly Building at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. This uh, Starship launch facility, launch site, is located about 1,000 feet uh, east of the existing Falcon 9 launch stand at Pad 39A that SpaceX uses for uh, regular satellite missions as well as crew missions to the International Space Station. If you want to uh, watch a continuing stream of the Starship construction operations at Pad 39A, during daylight hours, we provide that stream to Spaceflight Now members. You can go to spaceflightnow.com and click the Members tab at the top of the home page to become a member and uh, gain access to this feed. You can also become a member of uh, our Spaceflight Now YouTube channel for exclusive access to video as well as a discount in the Spaceflight Now store. We're back live now with a full screen view of Pad 41, where the Atlas V remains in a hold to wait for improved weather conditions. Uh, right now, the Anvil Cloud rule continues to be red, according to United Launch Alliance, and the uh, upper-level wind constraint is also uh, still a concern.
The latest weather report from ULA indicates that the expected clear time for this anvil cloud rule has been extended from 6.15 to 6.30 p.m. But the general trend is that these uh, clouds high over the launch pad are thinning and uh, the weather team is optimistic that the clouds will thin enough to uh, allow this weather rule to go green tonight before the end of the launch window at 8 p.m. Eastern time. The other concern involves upper level winds and the weather team reports that the winds are not uh, particularly strong. The issue is associated with uh, the wind shear, the variability in the winds throughout different uh, levels of the atmosphere. And uh, the upper level winds are actually not part of the uh, weather constraints that are tracked by the weather officer and the range here at Cape Canaveral because the weather upper level wind constraints vary depending on uh, the trajectory of the rocket and also the type of rocket. Each, uh, each rocket has its own upper level wind constraints and uh, weather balloons are sent aloft from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station throughout the countdown to measure the wind speeds and direction at different levels and this allows the uh, engineers form the launch provider, in this case United Launch Alliance, to plot a solution for the Atlas V to navigate these winds on the way to space. And right now the specific wind conditions throughout the vertical column of the atmosphere are, are not uh, acceptable for the, for the Atlas V to make its way safely into space. But these winds are ever-changing and more balloons are sent aloft throughout the uh, launch countdown and launch window to see if those uh, conditions change. And if they change uh, sufficiently, the upper level winds could become acceptable for flight. Again, the countdown is in a hold right now at T-minus four minutes in holding. All of the launch preparations up until the point about 16 minutes before liftoff time, 16 minutes before liftoff time have been completed but uh, the preparations beyond that L minus 16 minute point have not been completed. So uh, once those preparations pick up, we expect to be about 16 minutes from a liftoff time.
as the countdown clock continues to hold at T-minus four minutes. Uh, one thing of note that uh, some of our viewers and readers have uh, mentioned is that one of NASA's WB-57 airborne imaging and research aircraft is uh, on approach to the Cape Canaveral area right now at an altitude of about 49,000 feet in this view from a FlightAware tracking map. The WB-57 uh, was also in the area just south of Cape Canaveral, just offshore of the uh, Patrick Air Force Base area, circling during yesterday's launch attempt. The WB-57 uh, departed Ellington Field in Houston near Johnson Space Center uh, a couple of hours ago and is now approaching the launch area. So we asked the uh, U.S. Space Force, uh, who is the customer for this mission, the reason uh, for this WB-57 uh, being in the area for launch, and they told us that the uh, USSFF, USSF requested support from the NASA WB-57 aircraft to enable debris characterization if there were to be an anomalous condition in flight, and they added that this is a nominal, nominal operation. So we've often seen the WB-57 uh, supporting uh, NASA launches as well as a re-entry of SpaceX's Dragon spacecraft and Boeing's Starliner spacecraft. And today, this uh, WB-57, which is one of uh, several in NASA's fleet, is uh, approaching the Cape Canaveral area for imaging of the Atlas V rocket as it climbs into space this evening, uh, weather permitting, on this mission to deploy two experimental satellites for the United States Space Force. And again, the statement that we received from the Space Force was that they requested the support from this NASA WB-57 aircraft to enable debris characterization if there were to be an anomalous condition in flight. So that's the reason the, the WB-57 may be visible in the skies over Cape Canaveral or if you're tracking the um, aircraft map, uh, that's the reason it's in the area according to the Space Force. Again, right now we're waiting for the weather to clear to allow ULA to proceed with the countdown to launch the Atlas V rocket on the USS F-12 mission. Right now the countdown continues to hold at T-minus four minutes. Now about an hour and 39 minutes left in tonight's window.
the upper level uh, wind concern has now been resolved. The ULA engineering team was able to load a good trajectory solution into the Atlas V's uh, flight computer, the Inca flight computer, as it's known. So the trajectory file that's been loaded into the guidance system has now been uh, confirmed good to go. So the upper level wind concern has now been cleared. The only issue still facing the launch team tonight is the ample cloud rule. And there's still optimism among the weather team that the ample cloud rule will clear during the window. Right now the estimated clear time is 6.45 p.m. Eastern time or 22.45 UTC. However, this estimated clear time has been pushed back a couple of times from uh, 6.15 to 6.30 and now 6.45.
as you can see in that previous uh, launch pad view as well as this satellite picture it's uh, continuing to be overcast this evening at uh, the Cape Canaveral spaceport however all the rain showers and thunderstorm activity remain well to the west of the launch site so there's no direct lightning threat right at the uh, launch site at this time but the concern that's being tracked by the launch weather officer is associated with that uh, gray deck of anvil clouds high over the launch pad. Those anvil clouds uh, could contain some electrical charge and there's a phenomenon known as a rocket triggered lightning as the rocket uh, climbs through those clouds with its uh, exhaust plume stretching down to the ground there is a chance that the rocket could actually trigger a lightning strike which would uh, could cause a problem for the launch and that's the reason there is this anvil cloud rule in place in addition to the uh, rules about the, there being actually no lightning strikes within the 10 nautical mile limit around the launch pad as well as uh, a rule known as surface electric field mills which uh, is a measurement of the electrical charge in the atmosphere those other lightning rules and the field mill rule are currently acceptable for launch, but this ample cloud rule remains red. We just heard from ULA's launch team that the earliest the weather officer expects this anvil cloud rule to clear has once again been pushed back to 7 p.m. Eastern Time or 2300 UTC. So we'll continue holding here for another period of time to wait for this anvil cloud to uh, go green or clear and that weather rule to go green. We've mentioned uh, several other activities going on along the Florida Space Coast tonight. The Artemis 1 rocket are preparing to roll back to the vehicle assembly building tonight. We showed you a view of SpaceX's construction site at Pad 39A where the uh, Starship launch pad gantry tower is being built up uh, this summer. One other thing we'll be covering later tonight is the scheduled launch of uh, Virgin Orbit's Launcher 1 vehicle. This is an air-launched rocket that will be uh, released from the wing of a Boeing 747 carrier aircraft. Uh, Virgin Orbit, uh, part of Richard Branson's uh, Virgin uh, family of companies, uh, originally planned to launch this mission back on Wednesday night, two nights ago, but the uh, team uh, scrubbed the launch due to an issue with the propellant temperature on the rocket. The rocket consumes uh, kerosene and liquid oxygen. It's actually the first uh, air-launched orbital-class rocket to uh, use liquid propellants. But that issue has been resolved according to Virgin Orbit, and this mission will, will uh, go ahead tonight, uh, carrying seven small CubeSat payloads into orbit for the uh, U.S. military and for NASA. The uh, aircraft will depart the Mojave Air and Spaceport in the high desert of California and then head off shore over the Pacific Ocean and uh, reach a launch or release point west of San Diego or southwest of Los Angeles to uh, send this rocket aloft with these seven small satellites. This will be the fifth flight of uh, Virgin Orbit's uh, Launcher 1 vehicle which is designed to carry small payloads into low Earth orbit. The uh, launch window opens at 10 p.m. Pacific time 
or 1 a.m. Eastern time tonight and runs for four hours. And Virgin Orbit plans to provide a live webcast of this mission uh, starting before the takeoff or departure of the Boeing 747 carrier jet from Mojave. And we'll provide a link to that stream on spaceflightnow.com as well, as well as our running commentary in our mission status center. So we're, we'll be covering later tonight the launch of the Atlas V, assuming the weather clears tonight from here at Cape Canaveral, and then the launch of this uh, Virgin Orbit Launcher 1 vehicle from uh, an airborne platform off the coast of California, and then also the return of the Space Launch System moon rocket to the Vehicle Assembly Building, a busy uh, night of space activity in the United States as the uh, Independence Day weekend uh, gets started here in the United States. Back live with a view of the Atlas V. This comes from a camera on top of the vehicle assembly building looking east toward Pad 41. This is the uh, famous structure at the Kennedy Space Center used for a stacking of the uh, Saturn V rocket from the Apollo program, the Space Shuttle program, and now for the Artemis program with the Space Launch System. And the VAB is uh, the building that the Artemis I moon rocket will, will be rolling back uh, to overnight tonight expected to arrive outside the VAB to head into the high bay sometime around sunrise, perhaps uh, between 6 and 8 a.m. potentially, if uh, the rollback goes, uh, goes uh, at the paces of the previous uh, moves of the Space Launch System. It should take between 8 to 12 hours from the time that the rocket leaves the pad until it's officially uh, hard down in place inside the VAB. If you're just joining us, you're looking at a live view of United Launch Alliance's Atlas V rocket at Space Launch Complex 41. The countdown remains in the hold at T-minus four minutes to wait for uh, an anvil cloud condition over the spaceport to clear. The window extends until 8 p.m. Eastern time 
or midnight UTC on the upper right hand of your screen. You can see the countdown clock is holding at T minus four minutes. And the end of the window clock now shows about, about one hour and 11 minutes until the uh, window closes at 8 p.m. local time here in Florida. In this view of Space Launch Complex 41, you can see the Atlas V rocket just on the other side of the mobile launch platform umbilical tower. The vapor you see streaming away from the uh, rocket in this view is uh, gaseous oxygen uh, venting away from the rocket. The vehicle is fully loaded right now with uh, liquid oxygen propellant as well as liquid hydrogen propellant and kerosene fuel for the first stage. And the cryogenic propellants, liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, uh, boil off slowly in the uh, ambient Florida atmosphere into a, from a liquid to a gas, and the gas vapors you're seeing is that boil off. And throughout the countdown, the launch team continues replenishing these propellant tanks with uh, small amounts of uh, propellant to make sure those tanks remain at flight level and replace any propellant that boils off during this countdown, and uh, especially during this hold uh, to wait for improved weather. On the left side of the Atlas V is the uh, structure called the Crew Access Tower. That's the uh, access tower that astronauts will use for future missions uh, launching astronauts on the Atlas V rocket. And then the uh, structures on the edges of your screen, the antenna-like structures that's sticking above the ground, are lightning protection towers. We just heard from ULA's launch team that the team is coordinating a new launch time, a new target launch time now of 7.15 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time or 23.15 UTC. So this is about 25 minutes away. We haven't heard officially yet that the uh, Anvil Cloud Rule is green, but this is the first official new target launch time we've heard uh, from the team since the uh, team determined that the liftoff at the opening of the window would not be possible. So right now the launch is scheduled for no earlier than 7.15 p.m. Eastern Time or 23.15 UTC, uh, pending a confirmation that this Anvil Cloud Rule is now acceptable for flight. So we're now about 23 minutes away from this new target launch time of 7.15 p.m. Eastern Time or 23.15 UTC.
The clock you're seeing on the upper right uh, continues to show the clock holding at T minus four minutes. This is a built in hold that the uh, countdown entered more than an hour ago. Below that, the time to launch clock is the clock ticking toward the target launch time for the Atlas V at 7.15 p.m. Eastern Time or 23.15 UTC. That's now 16 minutes and 11 seconds away. Oh, minus 16 minutes. Sierra TD, Elsie. Go ahead. Begin WFOV transfer to internal power. Starting the process now. And we're now streaming some uh, audio from the Atlas V launch team. Uh, that call was the uh, command to the console operator to transition the wide field of view test bed spacecraft. That's the uh, bigger of the two payloads going to space on this mission to transfer that spacecraft to internal battery power. That's part of the configuration uh, step to uh, make sure that the spacecraft is ready for launch. LC, this is CRTD, Channel 1. Go. WFOV is on internal power and ready for IPS to go to enable. Roger. LC, LD, Channel 1. Go, LD. Roger, Load contingency adjust file. Adjust underscore AV094 underscore 08 with an SDL CRC of 97 Charlie Charlie. Roger. Flight control, LC. Go ahead, this flight control. Load contingency file. Adjust AV094 underscore 08 with SDL CRC 97 Charlie Charlie. Roger, and work. L minus 13 minutes. Now 13 minutes. Until 13, we will hold off on IFPS transfer to L at, or at L minus 9 minutes. We've heard confirmation that all the weather rules, including that anvil cloud rule that uh, held up the countdown for more than an hour, are now green. So this will uh, allow the launch team to proceed into the terminal countdown and launch of the Atlas V rocket this evening from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. We also heard a call out from the uh, spacecraft team that the wide field of view test bed spacecraft is on internal power. This is the spacecraft that uh, is heading up to space to geosynchronous orbit to test a new infrared sensor for future military missile warning satellites.
All communications switch to channel one. All personnel and visitors remain in present position until launch. Maintain operational silence in the LCC. No minus 10 minutes. Terminal count briefing. If a condition exceeds a launch constraint any time after a terminal count status check, the observer shall announce hold, hold, hold on channel one. Identify their station and briefly state the reason for the hold. Flight control perform launch on time verification. Now less than 10 minutes from the scheduled launch time for the Flight USSF-12 control. mission. Roger. OSM, place SRV ignition SNA switch in enable position. LC the flight control. Go. Contingency file adjust underscore AV094 underscore zero, zero 08 with SDLCRC97 Charlie Charlie has been verified and loaded into the Inca. Roger. LD LC. LD on channel one. Permission to enable IFES. Roger. Proceed. That last call, enable IFPS. L minus nine minutes. Flight control, enable WFOV IFPS. Report complete. The IFPS is the in-flight power system that will provide power to flight, the spacecraft and payloads copy. during the climb to space. Roger. This is a relatively recent... OSM place SRB ignition SNA switch in enable position. A recent augmentation SRB to the Atlas V's enable. capability. Box 2, verify CISA purge flowing GN2 to the CISA. Verified. OSM, verify the FCO, ROC, and OSM hole fire switches are in the proceed position. Ready to proceed. RLM, verify redline monitor and vent table are in the correct configuration for terminal count. Verified. RC, verify solar radiation acceptable for launch. Verified. WFOV IV IFPS enabled. Roger. CRTD, begin telemetry verifications. LC, CRTD, we can confirm 33.04 volts. Roger. And flight control looking for your launch on time verification. Roger. And we're. Yeah, L minus eight minutes. Coming up on the pre launch poll uh, to be conducted by launch conductor Scott Barney at the Atlas Space Flight Operations Center. Launch on time verified. Roger. All steps are complete prior to the status check. LC, switch to ready position. L minus seven minutes. Status check to proceed with terminal count. Atlas systems, propulsion. Go. Hydraulics. Go. Pneumatics. Go. Hello two. Go. Water. Go. Centaur systems, propulsion. Go. Pneumatics. Go. LO2. Go. LH2. Go. Has gas. Go. Electrical systems, airborne. Go. Ground. Go. Facility. Go. RFFTS. Go. Flight control. Go. GCQ. Go. Operation support. Go. Com. Go. Umbilicals. Go. ECS. Go. Redline monitor. Go. Quality. Go. Op safety manager. Go. ULA safety officer. Go. Vehicle system engineer. Go. Anomaly chief. Go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch director. Stand by. Awaiting uh, POLs for winds. Roger. I will hold prior to coming out of the count. That was launch conductor Scott Barney completing his poll of uh, the engineering team and the launch team at the Atlas Space Flight Operations Center. All of... And LD, LC, that one? LD. Are you expecting uh, to get a uh, clear in the next uh, minute and a half? Yes, we are. This is the LD. Launch vehicle is ready to launch. Roger. Mission director. Mission director, you have permission to launch. Proceeding with the count. And there's the final go from the launch verified director. T0 sit is set for 2315-000. Verified. CRTD verified. WFOV is configured for launch. WFOV is configured for launch.
FTD verify ring is configured for terminal count. Ring is configured for terminal count. All steps are complete prior to terminal count. Now 45 seconds until the clock resumes at T-minus four minutes. This will be the 94th flight of an Atlas V rocket and the 676th flight of a rocket carrying the Atlas name dating back to 1957. On my mark, the time will be T minus four minutes and counting. Three, two, one, mark. 359. Transferring ring to internal power. Roger. 355. Ground pyro is enabled. And the countdown has resumed at T minus four minutes. The USS F 12 ring spacecraft in the lower position of the payload fairing is now on internal power. Three thirty. Atlas hydraulics have flight pressure. Again, this mission is launching two experimental payloads for the U.S. Space Force. One uh, testing future missile defense technology, and the other testing a number of classified experiments. Three minutes. Securing Ellis, who's talking. Ellis tank to flight pressure. 250. FPS internal. You'll be continuing to hear call-outs from the ULA launch team here at Cape Canaveral. After launch, you'll hear, you'll hear uh, Patrick Moore, who is the telemetry commentator, uh, monitoring data coming down from the rocket as it uh, climbs into orbit tonight. T minus two minutes and counting. 159. Vehicle internal. 155. Font sequencer start. 150. Securing Centaur LH2. Securing Centaur LO2. One forty. Launch enabled. One thirty seven. One thirty. FTD, FTD verify ring is configured for launch. Ring is configured for launch. One twenty. OCU's arm. Right now the Atlas FCS count started. The Atlas first stage and Centaur. Reduce ECS first for stage are both on Roger. internal power. One ten. Vent valves locked. The flat termination system has also been armed for flight. One minute. Range green. Inside of 60 seconds until liftoff of this fourth Atlas V flight of the year and the 28th launch from Florida Space Coast in 2022. Forty seconds. Able at step three. Verify ECS reduced for launch. Verified. 25. Status check. Go Atlas. Go Centaur. Go USS F 12.
T minus 10 seconds. Eight, seven, five. Release. Full thrust. And vehicles cleared the tower. Vehicles begun the pitch over program. Body rates look good. And PU's gone to closed loop. System response looks good. Now 20 seconds into flight. Personnel report to operation. Atlas is now completing the pitch over maneuver. Body rates continue to look good. RD-180 is throttled down slightly to partial thrust. Response looks good. Now 36 seconds into flight. Atlas 5 is now passing Mach 1. RD-180 continue to look good in partial thrust mode. Seeing good chamber pressures on all SRVs. And at 49 seconds into flight, max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. RD-180 engine operating parameters continue to look good. SRB chamber pressures also look good. Now passing one minute into flight. RD-180 now throttling back up to full thrust as expected. Now one minute, 10 seconds since launch. Chamber pressures on the SRBs continue to look good. RD-180 engine operating parameters also look good. You're hearing Patrick Moore, the telemetry commentator. Now one commentator. minute, 23 seconds into flight, approximately three minutes now remaining in the boost phase of flight. Approaching burnout of the and SRBs. And at this point in the flight, Atlas V now weighs just one half of its liftoff weight. And see SRB chamber pressure is tailing off now. And we have SRB burnout. One minute, 45 seconds into flight. RD-180 engine operating parameters continue to look good. And we have jettison of all four solid rocket boosters. There you saw an onboard camera view of the jettison. Vehicle has gone to closed loop steering. Body rate responses look good. Just past two minutes into flight now. RD-180 throttling down slightly as expected. Engine operating parameters continue to look they good. personnel for Operation 70 Step 50, Star System Securing. And two minutes now remaining in the boost phase of flight. Atlas V is now 50 miles in altitude, 78 miles downrange distance, traveling at 5,000 miles per hour. Two minutes, 40 seconds in. RD-180 engine operating parameters continue to look good. Vehicle body rates looking good throughout boost days. And the Centaur Reaction Control System is now pressurizing to flight level. System response looks good. Coming up on three minutes into flight. RD-180 now throttling to maintain a constant 2.5G acceleration limit, seeing good response on the RD-180. Next major milestone will be payload fairing jettison. It's continue to look good throughout boost phase. Now passing three minutes, 20 seconds into flight. Approximately one minute now remaining until BECO. And there's payload fairing jettison. And we have good indication of payload fairing jettison and CFLR deck jettison. Vehicle's now throttled back up slightly. Engine response continues to look good. And RD-180 now throttling to maintain a constant 4.6G acceleration limit in preparation for BECO. And we have boost phase chill down. Passing four minutes into flight. Vehicle systems all continue to operate anomaly throughout boost phase. Body rates continue to look good. RD-180 engine operating parameters continue to look good as it maintains that acceleration limit. Standing by for BECO shortly. And we have BECO booster engine cutoff standing by for stage step. And we have good indication of stage separation. We have pre-start on the RL-10, standing by for ignition. We have ignition and full thrust on the RL-10. Chamber pressure looks good, body rates look good.
And there Centaur's you see it. Centaur's gone to closed loop steering. Body rates continue to look good. And onboard camera showing the RL-10 engine firing. Now five minutes into flight. Everything looks RL good so far. RL-10 pressure continues to look good. Body rates look good. This first burn of today's mission will last approximately six minutes, 18 seconds. This is Atlas Mission Control at T. You're hearing Patrick Moore, who is the telemetry commentator for United Launch Alliance, uh, watching data coming now down. Now passing from the five rocket. minutes, 20 seconds into flight. Centaur is now 115 miles in altitude, 600 miles downrange distance, traveling at 13,000 miles per hour. This RL-10 engine is made by Aerojet Rocketdyne. It Centaur PU has gone to closed loop control. Oxygen. System response looks good. Now passing six minutes into flight, approximately five minutes now remaining in the burn. Body rates continue to look good throughout the burn. Engine operating parameters also look good. And we have begun to see the RCS thruster firings during the burn as expected for thermal conditioning. Now passing six minutes, 30 seconds into flight, Centaur is now 130 miles in altitude, 890 mile range distance, traveling at 14,700 miles per hour. And we have seen a, a momentary telemetry dropout as we um, changed the telemetry format as expected. Have regained telemetry. Body rates continue to look good. RL-10 chamber pressure also looks good throughout the burn. And after a brief review of booster performance, we see that uh, booster performed uh, just slightly above nominal. That report from Patrick Moore indicates that the RD-180 engine on the first stage performed slightly above expectations. Now passing eight minutes into flight, approximately three minutes now remaining in the burn. RL-10 engine operating parameters continue to look good throughout the burn. Body rates have remained stable, and we are continuing to see uh, some periodic thruster firings as expected to maintain uh, thermal conditioning of the system. Now coming up on nine minutes into flight and approximately two minutes now remaining in the burn. Centaur is now 135 miles in altitude, 1,550 miles downrange distance, traveling at 16,300 miles per hour. The RL-10 engine on the Centaur stage continues its first burn. This will place these two U.S. Space Force Now passing nine minutes, 30 seconds orbit. into flight. RL-10 operating parameters continuing to 
look good throughout the burn. Body rates have remained stable. Just under one minute now remaining in the burn. You're right now you're watching a view of uh, Pad 41 where the Atlas V launched nearly 10 and a half minutes ago. The Centaur upper stage is nearing the end. Now passing 10 minutes, 30 point. seconds into flight, about 20 seconds now remaining until Miko. RL-10 chamber pressure continues to look good. Body rates look good. Ten seconds to Miko. PU's gone to open loop. System response looks good. And standing by for Miko. And we have Miko, main engine cutoff. Centaur is now entering a 12 minute coast duration. RCS is engaged 100% 4S settling as expected. And with that, uh, telemetry commentator Patrick Morris confirmed the end of the first of three burns by the Centaur per stage on tonight's mission. This placed the WFOV test bed and the USSF-12 ring space. Now passing 11 minutes, 30 orbit. seconds into flight. On the upper... Centaur is now 127 miles in altitude, 2,000... 270 miles downrange distance, traveling at 17,500 miles per hour. But uh, you could have seen that the rocket is now in a parking orbit. Two more burns by the RL-10 upper stage engine are required tonight to uh, meet the target orbit at geosynchronous altitude, more than 22,000 miles, or about 36,000 miles. Just past 12 minutes into flight. Equator. RCS is continuing 100% 4S settling as expected. Body rates have remained stable since engine cutoff. and 10 minutes now remaining in the coast. The Centaur is now in a coast phase. It'll be reignited about 23 minutes after liftoff. And after initial review of trajectory data following the engine cutoff event, we see major orbital elements, apogee, perigee, and inclination are all very close to pre-flight predictions. ULA telemetry commentator Patrick Moore confirms that the Centaur reached its planned orbit after the first burn. Now passing 14 minutes into flight. Restart of the Centaur is scheduled for T plus 23 minutes and 13 seconds, and that burn will last about five and a half minutes. Centaur systems all operating nominally throughout the coast period. Just past 14 minutes, 30 seconds into flight. Continuing to see 100% 4S settling on the RCS system as expected.
just past 15 minutes into flight. This animation comes from ULA showing what the Centaur upper stage looks like with the wide field of view test bed spacecraft, the blue RCS now right ramping down to 65%, settling. The rocket continues coasting good across the Atlantic response. Ocean about eight minutes from restart of the RL-10 engine. RCS system temperatures look good. Body rates continuing to stay stable throughout the coast. LOX and LH2 tank pressures have remained stable during the coast. Now coming up on 16 minutes, 30 seconds into flight. Approximately six minutes remaining until MESS-2, Centaur systems all continuing to operate nominally throughout the coast. RCS is continuing 65%, settling as expected. Body rates continue to remain stable. Five minutes now remaining in the coast. Four minutes now remaining until MESS-2. Centaur systems all continue to look good. RCS is continuing its 65% duty cycle on the settling thrusters. Telemetry quality overall has been very good uh, throughout the burn and, and into the coast. We are seeing uh, just minor telemetry dropouts. Uh, however, telemetry quality overall has been very good. This animation shows the current location of the Centaur upper stage over the western part of Africa. Body rates continue to remain very stable throughout the coast.
Now about three minutes remaining until the restart of the RL10 engine on the Centaur upper stage. This upcoming maneuver will last about five and a half minutes to boost these two spacecraft into a higher orbit to a, an elliptical or oval shaped type orbit. And in approximately three minutes, the Centaur will ignite to begin the second burn of today's mission. 23 seconds prior to ignition, RL10 will begin the fuel and oxidizer pre start sequence. This burn will last approximately five and a half minutes. Centaur systems all continue to look good. And now approaching the final two minutes of the coast. One hundred seconds now remaining until mess two. Centaur is now engaged one hundred one hundred percent for us settling as expected. Body rates continue to look good. LOX and LH2 uh, tank pressures have remained stable throughout the coast. And tank pressure is now beginning to increase in preparation for the burn. Just under one minute now remaining until MES-2. Tank pressure is continuing to increase in preparation for the burn. 30 seconds to engine ignition. Centaurs begun the pre-start sequence. We have good pre-start on LOX and LH2 and standing by for ignition shortly. We have ignition and full thrust on the RL10. Chamber pressure looks good. Body rate stamping out nicely from the startup transient. This burn will last approximately five and a half minutes. Centaur has gone to closed loop steering. Body rate responses continue to look good. PU has gone to closed loop control. System response also looks good. RL10 engine operating parameters continue to look stable. Thanks for using. We heard confirmation from ULA's uh, telemetry commentator that the RL-10 engine began its second burn. This was a planned five and a half minute burn to place the two U.S. Space Force payloads into a higher elliptical orbit on the way to geosynchronous altitude, more than 22,000 miles over the equator. But uh, ULA has uh, ended its uh, audio feed to news media at this time.
this was expected to happen uh, during the launch sequence, uh, but unfortunately the timing of this uh, audio cut uh, occurred right after the start of this burn, so we're not able to bring you any live uh, coverage or live commentary about the burn as it's progressing. We will be monitoring ULA, uh, ULA social media for any update on the conclusion of the burn. We'll stay live until that planned cutoff of the Centaur upper stage, which was expected to happen at about T plus 28 minutes and 41 seconds. So about three minutes left in that burn. So, space, so ULA, again, has uh, ended its live audio feed to us, so we're not able to provide any real-time updates on the progress of this burn. And ULA has also ended its live webcast of the uh, launch tonight uh, during a burn. ULA uh, on social media reports that the RL-10 continues its burn now. This engine produces about 23,000 pounds of thrust. It's produced by Aerojet Rocketdyne, and it burns liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen propellants. Uh, these are among the propellants that were loaded during the countdown earlier this afternoon here at Cape Canaveral, Florida. Now less than two minutes left in this burn. We're continuing to show a live view of the empty pad at Space Launch Complex 41 where the Atlas V took off 27 minutes ago to begin this USS F-12 mission for the U.S. Space Force. Now about 90 seconds left in the burn. Coming up on the expected end time for this second Centaur engine burn. And ULA has confirmed main engine cutoff number two. This completes the second of three engine burns for tonight's mission. The Centaur upper stage will coast for more than five hours now until, the, uh, until it reaches the appropriate point in space at the right altitude for another burn that will last about two and a half minutes. That burn is uh, scheduled to get underway at T plus 5 hours and 44 minutes. That's around 1 a.m. Eastern Time or 500, 0500 UTC. And then that, that will uh, circularize the rocket's orbit more than uh, 22,400 miles over the equator, just above the uh, altitude of the geosynchronous belt which is the uh, position where satellites will orbit the Earth 
in lockstep with the Earth's rotation, uh, giving them a fixed field of view over the planet. And then the Centaur will release the wide field of view testbed spacecraft about five hours and 49 minutes after launch. That'll be around 1.04 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And then the final spacecraft, the USS F-12 Ring vehicle, will be deployed at around 1.20 a.m. Eastern Time, or 0520 UTC. That's about six hours and five minutes after liftoff. Now 32 minutes since the launch of ULA's Atlas V rocket. We'll be bringing you more coverage of that on spaceflightnow.com and on our social media throughout the rest of the evening. Meanwhile, over at Launch Complex 39B, NASA's Artemis I moon rocket, the Space Launch System, is preparing to be rolled back to the Vehicle Assembly Building tonight. Here's a live view of this 322-foot-tall uh, vehicle on pad 39B. Ground teams here at the Kennedy Space Center have now assembled and are undergoing final preparations to begin rolling this uh, giant rocket back to the Vehicle Assembly Building tonight. The first motion to begin the rollout from rollback from Pad 39B is expected around 11 p.m. Eastern Time, or 0300 UTC, and that rollback will take about 8 to 12 hours to complete. It's about 4.2 miles between the launch pad and the VAB. This rocket is returning to the Vehicle Assembly Building for final launch preparations ahead of liftoff of the Artemis One test flight to the moon scheduled as soon as late August. This uh, rocket completed uh, testing and a fueling demonstration on the pad last month and NASA is now moving forward with launch preparations but it has to bring it back to the VAB for final inspections and closeouts and testing including a repair of a hydrogen leak that was detected during that fueling test last month We'll have live coverage of this rollback of the Space Launch System to the Vehicle Assembly Building beginning around 11 p.m. Eastern Time, or 0300 UTC, and we'll have live streaming coverage of this rollback throughout the night. They'll be riding one of NASA's crawler transporters for this journey along the crawler way back to the VAB. We'll give you one last live look of SpaceX's Starship launch pad under construction out at Launch Complex 39A. You can see the launch pad gantry tower for SpaceX's second Starship orbital launch site well under construction now. This structure now stands about 150, a little more than 150 feet tall out of its total height of um, eventually it'll stand about 450 feet in height. Three of the segments have been stacked into place and more segments are expected to be transferred to Pad 39A in the coming weeks for stacking. This will be the new home, the second home of uh, Starship launch operations for SpaceX's uh, next generation reusable rocket. If you want to watch a continuing streaming video of the construction of SpaceX's Starship launch pad here in Florida, you, you can become a Space Flight Now member. You can go to the 
spaceflightnow.com homepage. Click the Members tab at the top of the homepage, and if you become a member, you'll have uh, exclusive access to a live stream of uh, the Starship pad construction during daylight hours here at the Kennedy Space Center. Meanwhile, looking ahead at the uh, next few launches on our calendar, uh, later tonight, Virgin Orbit will be in action in California with its uh, air-launched Launcher 1 rocket system carrying a, a suite of seven small satellites, CubeSats, into orbit for the U.S. military and for NASA. Virgin Orbit is pr preparing to uh, launch this mission from its uh, Boeing 747 carrier jet off the coast of Southern California, west of San Diego or southwest of Los Angeles. The uh, launch window tonight opens at 1 a.m. Eastern Time or 10 p.m. Pacific or 0500 UTC and extends for four hours. Virgin Orbit is going to be providing a live stream of this uh, operation beginning before the takeoff of this carrier aircraft from the Mojave Air and Space Port north of Los Angeles and continuing to follow that uh, aircraft as it makes its way to the release point over the Pacific. We'll be uh, streaming uh, Virgin Orbit's webcast on spaceflightnow.com and providing live updates minute by minute in our mission status center. A few launches are on tap next week, beginning with the uh, liftoff of the maiden flight of the European Vega C launch vehicle. This is an upgraded, more powerful version of the Vega rocket developed uh, in partnership between the European Space Agency and uh, Avio, an Italian aerospace company. This will be carrying a uh, suite of small satellite payloads on this test flight from the Guiana Space Center in South America. On the same day, SpaceX is uh, scheduled to fly their next mission, a Starlink deployment flight from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station here in Florida. And then uh, no earlier than July 8th, another Falcon 9 rocket is set to launch from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California with another batch of Starlink Internet satellites. So these are the next four launches that we have confirmed target dates for this time. We'll be covering each of these. We'll be streaming live uh, for, these fa for the Falcon 9 launch from here at Cape Canaveral, but we'll be covering all of these missions live on spaceflightnow.com. One more look at the empty pad at Complex 41 where the Atlas V rocket launched on the USS F-12 mission at 7.15 p.m. Eastern Time or 23.15 UTC, beginning a climb into geosynchronous orbit that will last more than six hours, culminating in the final deployment of the final payload at around 1.20 a.m. Eastern Time or 5.20 UTC tonight. With that, we're going to conclude our live coverage of the USS F-12 launch here on YouTube. Check back on spaceflightnow.com for updates uh, throughout the evening as well as on our social media page on the rest of this Atlas V mission as well as the rollback of the Artemis I moon rocket to the Vehicle Assembly Building and the launch of Virgin Orbit's air-launched uh, Launcher 1 vehicle off the coast of California. So a busy night ahead. Until uh, next time, until later tonight, I'm Stephen Clark from spaceflightnow.com reporting live from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida.